Committee. My name is Councillor Anita Leach and I'm the Chair of the Committee. My role this evening is to ensure that the Committee runs smoothly, having regard to procedure, behaviour and ethics. To explain who the rest of the people on the tables here tonight are, to my immediate right is the Councillor's Solicitor, who will give, a, uh, give advice to the Committee on any procedural or legal matters that might arise. To my left are the Council Planning Officers, Highway Engineer and Environmental Health Officers, who will present the application this evening and give the technical advice to the Committee which may be sought. The rest of the people you see down both sides of the tables are the elected members who will consider the application this evening and make the decision. Before the application is considered, there will be a short presentation by the Planning Officer. As there is a qualifying petition for the application, one representative of the petition will be invited to address the committee in support of their petition. This will be up to five minutes. If a petitioner addresses the committee, then the applicant or their agent will be invited to make representation to the committee in support of their application. Again, up to five minutes. However, if a petitioner has not addressed the committee, then the applicant or their agent will not be invited to make any representation. A ward councillor can address the committee in relation to an application. The ward councillor may speak on behalf of the residents. However, once the ward councillor has returned to the public gallery, they may not return to take part in any debate that may be followed by the committee. The application will then be open to debate and discussion by members of the planning committee who will then make a decision on the application. If a site visit is requested and approved, then this item will not be discussed this evening and will be discussed at a subsequent meeting.
application number seven and number eight, 34 Wellington Road to Brighton, uh, by virtue of the fact it's in a conservation area and a decision has been taken to delegate the authority for an adjacent property since the last meeting. Okay, thank you. Are there any so just uh, to reiterate then for the members of the public who are here, for, um, oh sorry, but first of all can I just ask that we can agree on those five business members? Yes, yeah. Okay, for the members of the public who are here for uh, any of the agenda items for this evening other than the fire station, uh, we will not be discussing these items this evening, so you're welcome to leave, I'll just read them out for clarification. Agenda item 4, the Co-op Eswell Club in Park Road South, West Ways, 16 Lingdale Road, Agenda item 5, and Agenda item 7 and 8, which is Redcliffe, 34 Wellington Road. So if there's anybody here for those applications that would like to leave, then please feel free to do so now. which is land adjacent to Stormborn Massey Road. Um, we've decided to hold uh, this part of the meeting in, in the hall here. Um, so what I'm going to do first of all is ask the lead officer to make a presentation. Uh, thank you, through you, Chair. This application was subject to a member's site visit on Tuesday. Planning permission is sought for the erection of a single-storey, two-bay community fire station, together with operational and welfare accommodation, offices and meeting space, external trail and training facilities, and associated car parking. The site is located within the Greenbelt, and as such, the development applied for constitutes inappropriate development. Therefore, having regard to national planning policies and rural unitary development plan, policy GB2, which sets out guidelines for dealing with development in the Green Belt, such inappropriate development should be refused unless very special circumstances have been put forward that would outweigh any potential harm to the openness and character of the Green Belt. There are no national or local definitions to what constitutes very special circumstances, and as such, each application must be judged on its individual merits. In this case, the need for a new fire station in this Greenbelt location centres on the unavailability of suitable alternative locations outside of the Greenbelt, and the need to provide the best achievable emergency response to West rural locations. The rationalisation of the Merseyside Fire and Rescue Authority portfolio of operational fire stations has led to the need to optimise cost efficiencies, which has resulted in the closure of fire stations. In effect, in this case, either West Kirby or Upton would have to close as a result of budget cuts within, with Upton Fire Station remaining crude due to its more extensive coverage area. The provision of a new fire station in this location to cover both the West Kirby and Upton coverage areas would result in a reduction of response times to West Rural by an average of two minutes. There is a link between response times and the level of damage to property, severity of injury and the likelihood of death. The quicker the fire and rescue service can respond, the less likely that major damage significant injury or fatalities would occur. Closing West Kirby and Upton fire stations and building this new station at this location would result in faster and average response times, which could be the difference between the level of damage and or the severity of injury or even death. This new location would allow the fire service to maintain acceptable response times and it is argued that this demonstrates the very special circumstances that have raised the potential harm to the Greenbelt. The site sits opposite residential properties on Silver Massey Road to the north and Woodpecker, Woodpecker Close to the east. 
The nearest residential properties are 281 Sorgamassey Road and numbers 68, 70 and 72 Woodpecker Close. Um, if I could just spend a little time explaining the relationship of the proposal to those residential properties, um, and I'm going to put a different panel for members to see. Okay, so um, as I continue with the presentation, you'll hear me talk about the appliance bay. And when I talk about the appliance bay, I, I, that's the part of the, um, the fire station where the, the, the fire engines would be, would be housed. And then there's the operational bay, so that's the, the other side of the, um, um, uh, of, the, of the proposal. So that's where the meeting rooms and the sleeping accommodation kitchens and, 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 and those sorts of things would be. Um, so firstly, if I just um, look at the properties that front onto Silver Massey Road, you can just see them here across the top of this plan. Um, so they run through 286 to 296 Silver Massey Road, and they're located between 30 metres and 40 metres from the site perimeter. Um, so that's this part of the site here. 296 Silver Massey Road, um, so that's this, this property here is located 55 metres from the front of the operational and welfare part of the proposals, so that's this bay, and 59 metres from the appliances bay, which as I said, that will hold, um, house the fire engines. These distances decrease slightly with 288 being 50 metres from the operational bay and 57 metres from the appliances bay, before increasing again as you move east along Silver Massey Road. The blank elevation of 281 Silver Massey Road, so that's this bungalow here, and that's located 13 metres at its closest point to the perimeter of the site, and 30 metres to the operational bay. The appliances bay would be 45 metres from that property, but sits behind the operational bay. Numbers 68, 70 and 72 Woodpecker Close, so that's this group of three here. Um, they have their front elevations facing the site and their bungalows. <clears throat> These properties are uh, uh, sheltered, sheltered accommodation for um, uh, elderly people. So at its nearest point, <clears throat> excuse me, at its nearest point, number 68 Woodpecker Close is 14 metres from the site boundary. Number 70 is 15.5 metres, and number 72 is 17 metres from the boundary. Number 68 is 30 me 32 metres from the operational bay, number 70 is 34 metres, and number 72 is 35 metres away. The operational bay, as I said, sits between these properties and the appliance bay, um, acting as a buffer for the um, appliance bay where the fire engines would be housed. A sprinkler and generator compound, that's this, um, uh, this area down here, that's edged right on the plan, is located in the southeastern corner of the site. This is located 25 metres from the rear elevations of 47 through to 51 Woodpecker Close. These properties are located over 40 metres from any part of the proposed buildings. The training yard, it looks clear on that plan and it does on mine, but it's the yellow patched area or the plan behind me. And so the training yard would be located to the rear of the bays and would be in excess of 50 metres from the nearest residential property. A retractable training tower located at the southern part of the site, uh, so that's this element here. Training operations would typically be carried out at monthly intervals and during the working day without the use of sirens. The training tower will fold down when not in use to minimise its impact on Greenbelt. A noise assessment has been submitted with the application, which has examined noise sensitive receptors, including residential properties. Measures, measures are proposed to minimise noise impact. Although the station would be operational 24 hours a day, the yard would only be used when returning from an incident between the hours of 11pm and 7am and would only be used for operational and training purposes between 9.30 in the morning and 4.30 in the afternoon. Sirens would only be used at times when there is significant road traffic and, 
at that night restricted to calls where life is at risk. A number of conditions are proposed should this application be approved to avoid and or minimise noise impacts. In terms of highway movements and impact on the safe use and flow of the highway, the development is likely to generate low levels of vehicular movements onto the adjacent network and are therefore unlikely to have significant impact on traffic conditions in the area. The Silver Massey Conservation Area Boundary, um, so that's this pink hatching that you can see in the top left hand corner of the plan, sits some 35 metres to the northwest. However, given the use of materials proposed, existing vegetation providing screening and the distances involved, it is not considered the proposals would adversely impact on the, on the conservation area. Substantial weight must be given to any harm these proposals would have on Greenbelt by virtue of the permanent loss of openness and any visual harm that may result. Members must be satisfied that very special circumstances exist that outweighs any harm caused by inappropriate development. The reduced response times enabling the fire service to attend emergency in parts of West Wirral um, in parts of West Wirral will be two minutes quicker on average and has led to a finely balanced recommendation of approval. A number of measures proposed in terms of site layout, boundary treatment, together with planning conditions outlined within the report, serve to mitigate any um, harm to residential amenity. On balance, this application is recommended for approval and there is a qualified petition of objection. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Matthew. Um, as there is a petition on this, would the lead petitioner like to come forward?
I tend to not share with the members. And while the houses on Sultanbashi Road are 40 metres from this building, the access needless to the site is far less. And the frontage of the property is contained in every room on the lower floor, the bedrooms on the first floor. The fire appliances, when leaving the site in darkness, will have light flooding directly into these properties. So residents there will also suffer with light and noise pollution. Again, surely that's something we should not be condoning. I'll go on to uh, the pre application, uh, and in front of you tonight there's a, there's a piece of paper that was the pre application advice given by Sheila Day, uh, a long serving, very experienced senior planning officer, who said in the pre planning application, I'm concerned in the light of your poor back scenario of being able to redevelop the fire station at Upton within the urban area and with no impact on the green belt. Very special circumstances will not exist, in which case planning permission is not likely to be granted. Members, you may not be aware that this site is not and never has been the Forest Authority's first choice. The first choice was in fact the Greenby Library site. However, we all know what happened to that site, a huge public outcry, and the site was withdrawn. Well, as you can see by the officer's report, uh, there is a huge public outcry on this site as well, with a petition of 3,112 signatures, 559 online objections, and individual letters and emails sent direct to the planning department. A total of almost 3,700 people objecting. That is a large amount of people. The application is also objected to by the Solomon Massey Village Area Conservation Society, the Campaign for Rural England, and the Willow Society. So, Chairman Members, the fire service haven't had their first choice withdrawn, why did they not go for the second choice, another site that was not green belt? Yes, Members, they did have a second choice. It was identified by Kieran Timmons, former finance director and head of the fire station major proposals, who sent an email to the Lane Council's head of regeneration, which stated there were two sites that he classed as runners. They were the Greenby Library site, and the Sorgamassi Road Upton Bypass site. Strangely, in the applicant's design and access statement, the applicant says this site was suggested by local councillors. Really, just how disingenuous is that? It was their second choice, and the email is here for anyone to see, which outlines that site completely. That was recommended by Kieran Timmons, and yet in the design access statement, it was suggested by local councillors. Moving forward, the, the officer's report states that 14 sites were discounted. However, the applicant's design access statement does not show why the existing Upton site was discounted. That is because conveniently they never included it in the application. I really wonder why. How odd that there is no detailed, declared evaluation of the operational suitability of the Upton fire station, despite Upton being the only site that has passed the MFRS risk assessment risk assessments and has successfully been providing emergency service to the full area, including the further stages of West Kirby and Hoyle, for over two years. It's also worth noting at this point that when the government uh, handed out the grants to the station managers, it encouraged that any new developments should, where possible, include other emergency services, such as ambulance and police. Now, despite overtures from fire authority, both the police and ambulance service have made it clear they want no part of this proposed site. However, it's also worth making the Commission aware that the ambulance service have said that they would be interested in a joint venture with the fire service if they were to redevelop the Upton site. And of course, we know that Upton Police Station is directly opposite, so that would result in some kind of joined up working club for emergency services within a very short uh, distance of each other. Chair members, there are clear legislative guidelines as to what types of development constitutes permissible exceptions for Greenbelt developments in Willow GDP, Policy GP2. It clearly sets out that the applicant must prove that there is no alternative suitable location and that very special circumstances can be clearly demonstrated. I believe the important word we should be looking at are proof and no alternative. The Upton site, by the fire service's own admission, is their fallback site. A statement that was supported by the Chief Fire Officer in a letter 
as recently as September this year when he wrote, of the two stations, Upton provides more extensive coverage due to the proximity of West Cambridge to the coastline. It is for this reason that Upton is designated as a key station and will therefore be the station that remains open should the planning application for a new station sort of massive power not be approved. So there's clearly an alternative. Members, please take a moment to try and find yourself from where to see the day in a pre-planning application response and the words that just read out the Chief Fire Officer's letter as recently as September. And is it clear, very clear, that a non-green belt alternative is available at the existing Upton site? And in that case, circumstances, very special circumstances, cannot exist. On that alone, I believe you have sustainable grounds for refusing this application. I refer you again, so to bore you with this, to the formal plan advice given by Sheila Day to the applicant's architects in a pre-application phase. Members, absolutely nothing has changed since the pre-application advice was given, other than the applicant has made the footprint of the proposal slightly smaller. Sadly, that advice from Sheila Day appears to have been completely disregarded and is that why the recommendation is described as finely balanced? Chair, members, we contend that the recommendation is not finely balanced. It is simply wrong. Now, this matter hinges on the very special circumstances argument, which MFRS determined to be one of improved emergency response times, and their often repeated contention that there is no alternative, no plan B, no suitable alternative site. I and local residents contest both points and believe the very special circumstances case has not been proven. And we disagree with the contention that a move to sort of Massey Road offers an overall operational advantage that redeveloping Upton couldn't give. And an evaluation of emergency response data supplied by MFRS supports our view that very special circumstances have not been demonstrated. It is disingenuous for the applicants to keep suggesting that closing West Gary would endanger lives as coverage is met from Upton. The use of the future tense of wood seems deliberately phrased to hide the fact that the vast majority of all operational emergency responses have been emanating safely from Upton for over two years. Yes, West Gary is naturally open. Uh, but we do not believe that very much emergency response activity has been conducted from it for the last two years. I've spoken with firefighters on the doorstep, many of whom believe that desecrating non green belts is not the answer. And it's these same firefighters who tell me that West Gairdley is effectively closed as an operational station. This is simply a smokescreen so that MFRS can say West Gairdley is still open when it clearly is not operational in any sense of the word. So is the fire service telling us that current emergency cover from Upton is inadequate? Are they telling us that the risk assessment action over two years ago to manage emergency pull-ups from Upton was wrong? No, of course not. I and local residents contend they are simply trying to fabricate the case for this application. Extrapolation of MFR's response times and the right of statements of community involvement show combined average response times from Upton, including West Gabriel and Hoyley, as being 5 minutes 41 seconds, well within national maximum limit of 10 minutes and a national average of 7 minutes 24 seconds. Excuse me, can I just ask you a question? You've mentioned a couple of times there about uh, asking questions. Are they rhetorical questions yeah. or yeah. are you asking questions that need to be answered? No. Thank I'm you. making a point, Chair. Thank you for well, clarifying. Thank, thank you for clarifying. Sorry, Steve. Sorry, we haven't heard the fire service. Well, the fire service have attended seven public uh, can I ask you to continue, please? Okay, well, I'm just trying to put the record straight for Council of Facts. Even isolated response times from Upton to West Gaby and Hoylet, they are still on average 8 minutes 43 seconds, 1 minute and 17 seconds less than national guidelines. The public document referred as, to as a statement of community involvement shows no area beyond the national maximum 10 minutes from the Upton fire station. Though the applicant says parts of Hoylet might not be reached on 10 minutes. If so, then the area in question must be exceptionally small and isolated, as it doesn't even register on the time map in the planning application. Response times from Upton, including the furthest reach of West Gaby holiday, seem well within national guidelines. MFRS statistics, remember these, these times
times the statistics are provided by the fire service, and not my times and my statistics, they are the fire service. They show that Upton Station had typically three times as many emergency call maps as the West Gable Station. And moving to Sorbonne Master reduces response times on some call maps, but increases by several minutes a higher number of call maps from the vicinity of Upton, Thingwall, Kenfrey, Woodchurch Estate, the M53, and very importantly, the 900 bed Allen Park Hospital, which is perhaps the most critical facility in Willow requiring fire protection and at which there have been many call outs in the past. Strangely, the MFRS data suggests the average response time in the post or massive location is exactly the same as currently achieved on the arrival to West Gaby Station. This means there is actually no collective gain in average response time from moving to Silver Massive, and that actually the areas of most frequent emergencies, up to the thing will kind of will change, will certainly increase response times. And I believe it's worth repeating that the proposal would increase by a minimum of two minutes, two minutes, the response time to Allen Park Hospital, which has 900 beds. The officer's report states that West Gaby has a proportionally higher number of residents aged over 65. And we know that people over 65 are more at risk. But the data supplied, again by NFRS, again their data, contradicts that statement. It states, it should be noted, the data shows that Upton has more properties that cater for elderly than Hoylake and Mells and West Gaby and Thurston. But it does not state how many over 65s there are in other wards or station areas. It does say the highest mean age is actually in Thin Wall and Penfield with an average age of 46. So one has to assume that many of those residents fall into the 65 plus age group. The data also shows that over the last 10 years, incidents across Merseyside have reduced by 55%, with a reduction in incidents in West Gaby of 24%. I believe in this submission that I've spelled out clearly and precisely why this application should not be approved. And I believe I've provided the committee with sustainable reasons to justify refusal of this application. So, Chairman Members, in summary, MFRS only data shows that 77% of the call maps are to up to much of single country, including the 900 bed Allen Park Hospital, yet they want to move a minimum two minutes further away of their highest instances of response. Their data shows that up to much rich, thing one can be, has more properties that cater for elderly than Royal Lake and West Area and Thurston, and yet they want to move a minimum of two minutes further away from those very people. And perhaps most importantly, by the applicant's own admission, pre planning, and supported by the Chief Fire Officer's letter in September, there is an alternative in the Upton Fire Station, which has been providing cover for the last two years and can continue to do so within the national response lines. Not forgetting that there is still a further non green belt site, the fire service's second judge, approximately 700 metres from the application site, which is not green belt. For reasons best known to them, they have chosen none of these alternatives and have therefore failed to meet the guidelines within Little GDP, Planning Policy GP2, in that there is a viable alternative site at Upton in the urban area that is non green belt. And therefore, they have failed to demonstrate the very special circumstances to justify development on green belt. It's also important to remember that we, that is all 66 councils in Little, and in particular, the responsibility falls on you, the 13 members who make up this committee. We all have a responsibility to protect our green belt land. We are the guardians of it for people of will and future generations, and they quite rightly expect the council to protect it at all costs. If you as a committee approve this application, I believe you'd be setting a very dangerous precedent that would endanger the future of the world's green belt. So, on behalf of residents, I respectfully ask that you refuse this application. Thank you, Chairman and Committee members, for bearing with me.
Well, Chair, to be, to be fair, this is a very important application, probably the uh, most controversial one we've dealt with for, for some, uh, a long period of time. And I was encouraged by the numbers of people who turned up at the, the site visits and the number of petitioners that have put their names forward. Uh, I am somewhat surprised, though, Chair, that given all this public interest, not one single member of the public felt it, thought, thought it right to invest this committee. So, committee members, could hear genuine concerns of local members of the public or residents. And I hope that is it. I hope I will not be interrupted. I will interrupt the Council of Lately. Um, I'm also a little bit concerned about some of the language that's been used by Council of Lately against the fire service without the right of reply, without the decency of someone from the fire service to explain their case in an open forum in front of residents and councillors. So, I do hope, I do sincerely hope that it was not a tactical move to prevent members of the public speaking, to prevent the fire service from putting their case forward. If I find that out to be, to be true, then the fire service would rightly, would rightly have, have right to complain. I did also smell a large rat um, when I found out that the lead petitioner, who I believe was Les Spence when I was introduced to him at the uh, uh, site visit, was a former Conservative councillor. So I do hope there's been a genuine public engagement and no collusion behind the scenes before we get even get into the debate. So if it's all right for Councillor Blakely to use the words on site as we're trying to deceive the public, that the fire service are disingenuous, or there is fabrication taking place, then I think we need to set the grounding for that before comments are made. And there has been politics involved in this, whether, whether we like it or not. We are not a political committee. We are looking at the planning issues. There was clearly a site designated or, or thought to be appropriate at Greensby Library. I think the planning committee would expect to see fire stations, libraries, those type of constructions in, in those sort of uh, town centre type, type locations. And I, and I think it would have been a, a reasonable location with uh, some thoughtful architecture to, to fit into that, that area. But that was, there was a political campaign, and there was a residence campaign, and, th and that was listened to. So we are, I don't say, we are where we are in terms of the application, and the fire service are attempting to provide the best coverage they possibly can. And I will not accept, I can't accept as a councillor, that suddenly the only person who is an expert on fire cover and response times and everything like that is a Conservative councillor. I can't genuinely say that. So I will have to believe exactly, I will have to believe what the fire service are saying in terms of what they believe to be their case. We haven't had a chance to challenge and we haven't had a chance for them to, to put their case forward. So I, I, I will have to believe that. So that brings us to them, if that is the case issues around green belts and what is permissible and what you can do with green belt land. Okay, so I'm glad we went on the site visit. This is green belt land on the very edge of where the green belt designation begins. To my knowledge, it's undeveloped. It is, I didn't refer to it as scrub land, I think someone did on the site, but it is undeveloped. It is not of agricultural use, as I understand at the moment. Excuse me a moment, Steve. Um, could I just ask members of the public if they could give us some good order here, because we do need to hear the debate and, and the argument that goes on here. So, if I could just ask you to be respectful of those who are speaking. Thank you. But it is, it is designated within our plan as green belt. So then we have to look at the planning issue, the planning case, are these special circumstances or exceptional circumstances? And I would suggest, uh, as, as someone who sat on this committee, that there is already some precedent about areas where we have allowed green belt development. From my past knowledge, and I'm not that old, Ada Park was actually built on green belts, which is a hospital, to the public. And there have been applications to this committee to extend car parks, to, 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 to encroach on the green belt, to allow that, that special circumstance of an emergency service to function properly. So there is some precedent about green belt being released under special circumstances. Now, I may be a layman, I'm not a fire, fire, uh, fire officer, but surely if, if the Chief Fire Officer and his team are saying to us that this facility can enhance the service to a huge swathe of 
public in terms of your sponsor land, in terms of coverage, in terms of the circumstances you afford your circumstances, the fire service find himself in, then at least one of the tests, at least one of the tests about exceptional and special circumstances will have and should and could have been met. So I, I'm very disappointed that we haven't heard directly from the fire service, and I know they're the procedures, they're the applicants, and the applicants will have a, uh, the right to appeal. I generally, I generally have come into this room with an open mind and wanted to hear both sides of the case. Somehow that has been prevented from me taking place. So I, I, I will listen with intent to debate, but I think there needs to be a balance in the debate, and I'm very sorry the fire service has not been allowed to speak to that. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I would like to just comment on a few points. Uh, I too am disappointed that the fire service were able to, to speak this evening. I think it would have been useful for the committee to have had that part of the debate. But in terms of the uh, lead petitioner, they have the right to speak or not. On this occasion, I believe that they've chosen the right not to speak. Um, and the board councillor does have uh, the right to speak on their behalf. So, uh, Ian. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I've got a number of questions to ask as the debate goes on, which you can perhaps you know, bring to get later on as, as questions are raised as well. Um, can I begin by saying, I've, I've heard what Councillor Blake had said, and I've also heard what Councillor Phelps said. Um, I don't think it's anybody is to be criticised, whatever their political background, for getting involved in an issue in the community where they live. If Les Spencer gets involved as the lead petitioner, organises a petition, as the Chair has said, it's his right to speak or not, and he shouldn't be criticised. That. I think that's unfortunate. I think Councillor Blake has spoken on behalf of the residents. That's his job as a ward councillor. It's our job as a committee to listen to all the evidence before us. I've never heard you criticise any other application where the applicant has been prevented from speaking. Not one. Not one of you. Now, it's not a debate, Steve, so you can just finish my points if you don't mind. Um, on the, sorry, what was that? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, perhaps like a fire service, I want the right to reply. I think you've been a bit childish now, Steve, if you don't want to say to Can I just ask for some good So the decrease in, in response time to West will be 